so thank you to Arasu for the introduction uh, and to Swansea University for promoting me, um, but also hosting this event. Um, so as Arasu said, I'm going to talk about lots of different topics today. I'm going to try to weave a story through them. I, I might not do that as well as I hope, but I'll, I'll try to link um, a lot of my research. Um, but we're going to go from, I thought it was a laser pointer, but it's not. Okay. Um, we're going to go from fundamental photochemistry all the way to deployment of solar energy technologies uh, in the field. So you may have heard about specific, specific IKC. Specific deals with functionalizing coatings to integrate into buildings for the generation, storage, and release of energy at the point of use. I'm not going to talk about building scale PV for the majority of the work. I'm going to go back to some fo uh, fundamental photochemistry research. Um, but everything we do at Swansea University is geared towards improving the chances of commercialization of the next generation of technologies. Okay, that's a good start. I might have to use this. I walk around a lot, so I'm, I'm going to walk and come back. <laughs> now, I've been fortunate enough to hear many lectures from uh, professors over the years. And what I find is they all follow exactly the same format. And that is to have far too many slides that you can possibly get through in 35 minutes. Um, to get somewhere into the middle of the talk, realize you're really far behind, skip a chunk in the middle and say thank you and, and, and goodbye to everybody. So I'm going to follow exactly the same format um, today. So photochemistry, what is photochemistry? Well, in the truer sense, photochemistry is using light to drive chemical reactions. When we also consider photophysics, uh, we look at the movement of electrons. And if we take the simplest system there is, hydrogen, a one electron system, we can see we can absorb light, we can promote an electron from what's called its ground state, where it's happy, to its excited state, where it has excess energy. With that energy, we can do work. Of course, molecules and atoms in these excited states don't like to stay there very long and they like to lose that energy and return to their ground state. And through this, they emit light. The measurement of photophysics and photochemistry is spectroscopy. And on here on the right, we have the line series, um, first of the emission of light from hydrogen, and then from more complex systems with more electrons. And we can see greater line emission spectra, greater number of lines from these more co complicated um, elements. The amazing thing about spectroscopy is what it allows us to do. So, for instance, this allows us to determine the elements that are contained within the stars light years away. We can determine the temperature of those stars, we can determine the size of those stars, and we can determine the density of those stars, all from measuring the light emission. We can also look at things like planets interfering with these lines and passing um, past the surface of the sun, which tells us a lot about faraway planets and uh, their environment. Of course, these are atomic systems. When we move to molecular systems, we talk about um, now molecular transitions, and that really means electron density. So we're not talking about singular electrons anymore, but groups of electrons. And again, as we build up sorry, I'll, I'll stop there. And these systems can be described. The transitions of these electrons from ground states to excited states can be described by what's known as a Jablonski diagram on the left. And this summarizes all of the potential movements of an electron in the system. So we can absorb light. We can then emit light in a, in a a process known as photoluminescence. Photoluminescence can occur via two different mechanisms. One is fluorescence and one is phosphorescence. Phosphorescence being much longer lived than fluorescence. 
And one of the key things about when we absorb light and create an excited state is the fundamental properties of the molecules change. So as you can see by the diagram on the right, we've got the ground state in red, the excited state in blue. The molecule is bigger. Okay? So we can, through absorption of light, we create essentially different species. Okay? We could drive chemical reactions. They become stronger oxidants, stronger reactants. Um, and we can do a lot of chemistry with these materials. We can then lose that light through fluorescence, phosphorescence, energy transfer or quenching, relaxation to the ground state, or by moving around, heating up, and losing what's called non-radiative energy. As we build up, ah, there you go. As we build up systems further, we go from quantized energy levels. So we can fundamentally determine these energy levels on the left in materials, these are quantum dots, as we add more atoms and more uh, atomic uh, interactions and molecular interactions, we move to materials known as semiconductors. And semiconductors are materials where we can absorb light to do work, but we can no longer quantize the energy level positions within the valence and conduction band. And all photochemistry is, is studying the promotion and the deactivation of electrons in these different systems. And that underpins most of the chemistry of modern day life, certainly modern day technology. It allows us to develop things like photovoltaics, low energy lighting, quantum dots, fluorescent dyes for medical applications, um, LEDs, etc. Okay, so I'm going to journey a little bit through, probably I'm already behind time, journey a little bit through my uh, career, if you like, so, so forgive me if it's slightly self-indulgent, but I'm going to talk about my early career and my PhD, and then go on to some modern-day work. So I started my PhD um, at Swansea University, um, and in my undergraduate course at Swansea, I was offered the possibility to travel to Coimbra in Portugal to do a three-month research project uh, on these triarylamine dyes. And really, the, the important thing about this for me is, it was in my final year of university, if it wasn't for this opportunity, I certainly wouldn't have gone on to do my doctoral studies, and I certainly wouldn't be talking before you today. This was really the first opportunity in my scientific career to get into a research project, and this is where I fell in love with science. So we would, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we would study these dyes, and we were looking at them sorry, these triarylamines, and we were looking at them as potential whole transport materials for things like solar cells and uh, LEDs. From there, my PhD, which was split between Coimbra and Swansea, looked at these conjugated polymers. These are cationic conjugated polymers. The structure is on the left. They have lots of very fascinating um, characteristics. They're very sensitive to their environment. They have generally a blue fluorescence, so you can see the picture in the top right. Um, they have a blue fluorescence that is fairly easily quenched. In this case, it's quenched by an explosive material, and they find potential uses in explosive detection. You can again use them in things like polymer solar cells and polymer light emitting diodes. We were interested in their interactions with DNA, and there's lots of reasons why we were interest, interested in this. The possibility to control the compaction and decompaction of DNA, DNA with these polymer materials unleashes opportunities into gene therapy and understanding disease. Uh, so we would do things like fluorescence microscopy, which we still use today on, on solar cell materials that you'll see just in a moment. But we would look at strands of DNA, how they interact with these polymers, and the quenching and compaction. So you could see in the AFM images in the bottom right-hand corner, these globules of DNA that we can compact, and they're connected by strings um, of DNA and polymer. So we were working towards controlling the morphology of DNA and polymers on a surface. We were also very much interested in understanding the photochemistry of these polymers. One of the problems and one of the things that holds these polymers back for use is the fact that they aggregate. So they're very planar, they're very um, 
playing out flat molecules essentially. And when you increase the concentration of them, they all stack together. They tend to aggregate and that quenches um, their light absorption and light emitting ability. We would then look at the interactions of these materials with DNA, study the quenching of their fluorescence emission. Um, and we, we built up a really nice picture of the energy transfer along these polymer chains to, to quencher units, as we call them, where the polymer interacts with the DNA. That pretty much summarizes uh, my PhD research along those topics. And then from my PhD, I moved to Bangor University in North Wales, where I became particularly interested in photovoltaics and solar energy technologies. Now, some of you may have been here for Matt Carney's uh, inaugural lecture a couple of weeks ago, and he stole the quote that I was going to use about solar energy. So, so I used another favorite, um, which is, this, th this comes from address, an address in New York in 1912 from a scientist called Giacomo Cimancian. Apologies to the Italians in the audience for my butchering of his name, but he was a photochemist in Bologna. Uh, and back in 1912, he said this, the problem of the future begins to interest us. Is fossil solar energy the only the one that may be used in modern life and civilization? That is the question. He goes on, on the arid lands, there will spring up industrial colonies without smoke, and without smokestacks, forests of glass tubes will extend over the plants and glass buildings will rise everywhere. Inside these will take place the photochemical processes that hitherto have been the guarded secrets of the plants. But that will be have must sorry, but that will have been mastered by human industry, which will know how to make them bear even more abundant fruit than nature. For nature is not in a hurry and humankind is. And if, in a distant future, the supply of coal becomes completely exhausted, civilization will not be checked by that. For life and a civilization will continue as long as the sun shines. If our black and nervous civilization based on coal shall be followed by a quieter civilization based on the utilization of solar energy, that will not be harmful to progress and human happiness. So here we are, over a hundred years later, trying to realize this dream of learning from nature on how to convert solar energy, not into carbohydrates in the case of plants, but now into electricity to power our planet. This is a photo I like to show. So that this is Giacomo on his balcony in Bologna, where he, he has materials out um, to interact with sunlight to study their photochemical uh, changes that occur. And he was a pioneer in many ways. One of them was in the fact that he realized that we could move to greener chemistry through light-driven reactions rather than traditional heating things up uh, and dirty industrial reactions, if you like. Okay, so we need to utilize solar energy on a great, much greater amount than we currently are. And I'm going to talk about um, some, of the, some of the current progress in solar energy technologies in a moment. But really, these are the drivers for why we want to study solar energy. And of course, it's because the sun is an enormous nuclear reactor, safe enough away from the planet, around 93 million miles from Earth. Um, which provides us with more energy than we currently need. Okay, and the sun is an enormous source of energy. If we were to put the sun and all of the solar, all of the planets in the solar system on a mass balance and weigh them, the sun accounts for 99.8% of the mass in the solar system. It's a phenomenal source of energy. And when we look at it, in terms of other sources of energy, I think this graph summarizes it quite well. So on the right, we have the finite reserves of the materials we have to power our planet. These are the best estimates of how much we've got left. And on the left, we have our renewable sources and how much they deliver to the planet annually. Excuse the pun, but you can clearly see that solar eclipses all of the other energy sources we have available. 
interestingly, hydro is currently um, has the greatest installed capacity uh, on the planet for elect uh, renewable electricity generation, followed by wind, followed by solar. But investment in the solar technology has been driven by the abundance of energy available to us to capture. Our current world consumption is around 16 terawatts. Our target to mitigate climate change is to try to deploy 14 terawatts of solar photovoltaic um, capacity by 2050. Okay, so when we look at solar panels, most of you will be familiar with the ones on the left. These are silicon-based photovoltaics, known as first-generation photovoltaics. Um, they are a superb technology. For years, they had many issues, mainly around cost, embodied energy, and things like this. The, the field working on silicon solar panels has addressed many of the issues and now really very competitive and market dominant technology. So uh, with silicon, we're looking at between 20 to 25% efficiencies, lifetimes of 25 years. They're very stable material um, and now very cheap, um, predominantly thanks to the Chinese in developing uh, mass markets for silicon PV. So that was the first generation. The important thing to know about generations of PV is they don't necessarily get better with generations. Silicon is still market dominant. The second generation, though, look to address a flaw in silicon. And that is because it's what's known as an indirect band gap material. You don't need to know what that is. But what it means is you have to put down a fairly thick layer of silicon to absorb enough sunlight to make a decent amount of electricity. So the second generation looked to um, address those issues by putting down thinner layers of direct band gap materials uh, to improve uh, the state of the art. These are around 18 to 20% efficiency. They still require vacuum deposition, which is very expensive. We can put multi-layers of these semiconductors together uh, and they're very efficient, so up to 45% efficiency, um, uh, pushing 50% in cases. But they rely on elements that we simply do not have enough of on Earth to deploy the amount of capacity we need. So they are mutually um, used for space applications and small-scale applications. Then we move on to third-generation photovoltaics, so-called printable photovoltaics. And this is where... Um, most of my research has occurred. So the third generation looked to take a very different approach. Lower efficiencies, but based on earth abundant materials that we could print very quickly to produce very low cost solar power over very large areas. And we can do that through things like dye-sense dye solar cells, that I'm gonna to talk to you about in a moment, OPV, organic photovoltaics, and perovskite solar cells, which I'm also gonna mention. Historically, third generation photovoltaics suffered from very poor efficiency in compar comparison to the other technologies. Um, perovskites have certainly changed the game in that regard, up to record efficiencies of now over 25%, comparable with silicon, but much cheaper to produce. Okay, so what is perovskite? Um, well, a perovskite really is anything with this crystal structure, this arrangement of atoms and this ABX3. When I'm talking about perovskites for solar cells, what I'm really talking about is lead halide perovskites and things like methyl ammonium lead triiodide. I'll give you a quiz on that at the end to make sure you remember what it is. Um, but the important thing to know about these materials is we can change parts of them. So we can change the methyl ammonium for other cations. We can change the iodide for other anions. And that gives us chemical flexibility. Um, it allows us to tune the band gap or the color of these materials uh, and how they work. As a photochemist, I was really interested in their photoluminescence properties. And this is the photoluminescence of methyl ammonium tribromide. And these crystals are growing under the fluorescence microscope. So there's light incident on, incident on the sample. And, and we can see as the crystals grow, they begin to emit this brilliant green light. The other useful thing about perovskites is we can sandwich them, if you like, as an absorber material in lots of other materials. We have lo lots of architectures, as we call them, in which we can deploy them. 
and they are solution processable. So we can print them, much like newspapers. I've stolen that from Tristan. So we can print them very quickly, very low cost. There is also the option that we can piggy piggyback on the success of silicon technology and develop what's called tandem solar cells. So using a perovskite on top of a silicon solar cell to achieve higher efficiency. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about uh, perovskites in a second in a little bit more de de detail, but I'm gonna first mention dye sensitized solar cells because I think they're a very nice photoelectrochemical system. In a dye sensitized solar cell, we have a semiconductor, but the problem with the semiconductor is that it doesn't absorb visible light. So it means it's not very efficient as a solar cell. So that's why we sensitize the surface of that semiconductor with a dye. The dye does the work. The dye absorbs light. We generate excited states, as I mentioned earlier. That excited state energy is injected into the conduction band of the semiconductor, and we can produce a functional solar cell. With the perovskite, when they emerged on the market, the idea was that they worked the same, that you would just swap the dye for a perovskite material, that the perovskite itself would create an excited state, inject into titania, and that, that's how the device worked. Um, we now know that's not the case, and in fact, perovskites are very interesting materials because they have efficient charge transfer through the perovskite material itself. So we don't need to inject into a semiconductor. We can simply have what's called a planar device. So we can have a simpler device structure with perovskite solar cells. Uh, and if you look at the animation on the right, the way this works is it's sandwiched between uh, two other layers. The perovskite absorbs the light. We generate an excited state. We then separate these charges. So we make electrons go one way, holes go the other way, and that's a function in solar cell. And this is what they look like, um, our lab-based devices look like in the bottom corner. You can see we use gold contacts on the top um, at this scale um, to measure them. Okay, so when I then moved to Bangor University, I was very much interested in, in dye sensed dye solar cells. And the idea that perhaps if we can introduce more than one dye in the system, we can capture more energy from the solar spectrum. So in the top left, um, the line through the graph is what uh, the light instant on the planet is. Uh, so that's the light that we have to collect with our solar cell. And then we can do, uh, we can absorb different parts of it with different colored dyes. So we can use a yellow dye, a red dye, a blue dye, and perhaps a near infrared dye um, to absorb more of the light. So part of my challenge was to, to try to find dyes that would work well together. The other part of my challenge uh, and research at Bangor was to reduce the dyeing time. So the way you make these devices is you put an electrode in a dye solution, the dye sensitizes to the surface, you remove it after about 16 hours and you can complete your manufacture. Of course, that's far too long if we're gonna manufacture these things at scale. So we came up with a way to dye them uh, in just five minutes um, and, uh, and further at room temperature. So we advanced the sta state of the art from 16 hours to five minutes and what we found is we could also use this technique to then mix dyes quite effectively and produce really high performance, um, or higher performance, I should say, photovoltaics in five minutes compared to overnight. Um, we, we studied the dye uptake and understood the kinetics of the dye absorption to the surface of the semiconductors. And we did some nice photochemistry in Coimbra uh, to understand the energy level positions of these dyes and why they're complementary. And we used a technique called photoacoustic calorimetry, which is really interesting because you fire a laser at something and instead of measuring an optical uh, signal, you measure a pressure wave. You measure the acoustic response of a device, which is quite neat. Okay, so then when we came to look at perovskites, I was interested, well, can we co-sensitize? Can we use a dye and a perovskite in the same device. So I moved away from the high performance perovskite materials because they are dark and you can't visualize dye uptake to look at tribromide because it's orange. And here this allows us to visualize dye uptake. So we use this indoline dye on the top, which is this beautiful red color and this squaring dye at the bottom, which is this blue color. And we introduce them to the same, in the same device. 
when we measure the light absorption of these devices, we can see that we definitely have both the dye and the perovskite material in the same device. And then when we measure the electrical output at different wavelengths, we can see we, we are getting photocurrent from both the dye and the perovskite material. Uh, this is important because it allowed us to then understand that there's space available within a device to potentially to do more work with. <clears throat> so then this is, again is the device performance efficiencies. I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but the important thing to know is they improve. So we add a die and they improve over um, the systems without the die. And then when we looked at the time resolved photoluminescence studies, so how long, these, uh, how long the photoluminescent lifetimes are, what we find is the addition of the dye passivates defects in the perovskite and it uh, improves our overall device. Now, simultaneous, people started looking at things like self-assembled monolayers in devices to improve charge collection and to passivate defects. And in essence, we were doing a very similar thing, but also getting a photocurrent response from the material. Okay, so I mentioned the photoluminescence of perovskites um, is not typical. So generally, it, you would get the same emission from a material time and time again. What we find with perovskites, if I can make these play, that oh, that's a shame, um, but the video is not working. But but what you would see is um, the red fluorescence of a methyl ammonium lead triiodide uh, perovskite grow over time. So the intensity improves. And we spent quite a lot of time understanding this fluctuation of uh, photoluminescence intensity. And when we look at things like X-ray diffraction, it was quite interesting because what we realized is photo brightening, so the brightening of the emission of a material over time, for perovskites at least, was seen as a positive thing you're passivating defects within the device and improving the performance. When we look under the XRD at the same time, what we realize is we're actually undergoing degradation the same time as photo brightening. So in reality, it's not, photo brightening is still a positive um, thing for a perovskite to go through, but it masks potential degradation at the same time. Um, and we put together uh, a decent understanding, uh, true to form, I'm going to speed up a little bit, um, a decent understanding of how these materials react in air, in nitrogen, and what happens to them in terms of um, passivating these defects to cause the photoluminescence to improve over time and then to darken. And when it darkens, that's associated with complete degradation of the material. When these materials degrade, they split apart into the components. So we tend to end up with lead iodide left on a surface. That's handy because it's yellow in color and we can visualize it. We can also do time resolved spectroscopy. So we can measure the lifetime of this photoluminescence and we can use that to influence, um, and sorry, to, to develop understanding of larger scale processes. So Tristan Watson, uh, my colleague, works on printing of large scale perovskite photovoltaics. We can use time resolved photoluminescence to understand what's happening when he prints materials at a very large scale. Now this is useful because it allows us to study films that are printed and not full devices. So it saves another day of work in developing a complete device before you get the answers. So in the top right here, you'll see the time resolved photoluminescence of perovskites um, annealed at different temperatures. Alongside them are SEM images of those samples. And what we can see at 150 and higher temperatures, the formation of these lead iodide crystals, they act as recombination centers. That, that's a bad thing. So that leaks current from our device, essentially, uh, and causes, causes a shortening of the fluorescence lifetime in this case. So understanding these processes for, through photochemical um, characterization is really important for the scale up of PV. And then when you look at perovskites, one of the things, so not only does the photoluminescence change over time, most other properties change considerably over time. 
They're very, very difficult materials to measure. And we've had a go at mapping out all of the processes. So when we interact with light, we have various processes that happen within the perovskite material. If we interact with oxygen, we can do things like form superoxide. Superoxide is incredibly reactive and causes the degradation of our solar cell. We've done quite a lot of studies on that interaction with superoxide, um, which I'm not going to talk about today because of time, um, but there's some really interesting things there. They're also quite unstable to water, mainly because water will uh, dissolve the organic part of the perovskite, leaving lead iodide behind. But what I'm trying to show with this is the fact that however you change or however you try to measure your perovskite material, you perturb the system in some way, that is very complex. So when you're trying to do quite complex measurements on these systems, you have to have very, very stringent <coughs> experimental control or you're simply not going to get answers. And there's lots of examples of uh, poor characterization, let's say, of perovskites in the literature. Okay, so now I'm going to go away from photochemistry. Everybody breathes a sigh of relief. Um, and talk a little bit more about photovoltaics and the circular economy. So this is our current scenario. We need to deploy solar energy technologies at a faster rate than ever before. We know we have significant problems with global warming and climate change. It is now unequivocal that humankind has influenced our climate. I'm sure I don't have to to go through the detail here to this audience. But what is interesting is our reluctance to change. So we're still increasing our carbon emissions. They increase around 1.3% annually. Um, if we continue business as usu usual as we are today, we're likely to see somewhere in the region of a three to four temperature degree rise by the end of the century. That's catastrophic for life on Earth. So we need to try to limit the temperature rise globally, and to do that, we need to deploy much more renewable technologies. Our use of fossil fuel as a share of our energy mix has gone down by 0.1%. It's nothing to, to write home about, though, because actually our overall energy uses have gone up, so we're burning more fossil fuels than we ever have before. Renewables are growing very quickly, and that's positive. Uh, and they're growing predominantly because of economics. So for most locations on the planet now, wind, particularly onshore wind, uh, and solar photovoltaics are cheaper than fossil fuels. The disappointing thing there is we heard a lot during the pandemic about how we would build back better and perhaps take learnings from the pandemic into our quest to mitigate climate change going forward. That hasn't been realized, and since January 2021, globally there's been six times greater investment in the fossil fuels than renewable energy technologies. So we need to deploy technologies, and we need to deploy them very quickly. But what is clear as we transition, to a, uh, transition away from fossil fuels, we're going to use much greater quantities of minerals and critical raw materials that we have on Earth. So if you compare a car, if you compare a conventional car to an electric car, an electric car um, uses about 10 times more minerals than a fossil fuel car. That's not to say it's significantly better for the environment, because it is, but it does require more materials. And when we look at wind, solar, low energy lighting, and our energy technologies, they use a lot of similar materials. And this graph respects, uh, uh, reflects that. So for example, copper is needed for solar, wind, uh, and most technologies because we use it to tr transport energy. Um, lithium is obviously very important for uh, batteries. We need things um, like rare earths for magnets for both electronic, uh, sorry, electric cars and for wind turbines. We can't end up in a scenario where these technologies that we need to mitigate climate change have to fight for the same resources, because that will limit deploy deployment and it will significantly limit our ability to mitigate climate change. And when we're looking at emerging technologies like perovskites, it's important to look to the lessons of the past. So this is the deployment of silicon photovoltaics from the year 2000 to 2015, particularly if you look at 2005 to 2015, 
the amount of silicon deployed in the market increased enormously. We're at the point with perovskite solar cells where we're on the cusp of commercialization. It's very likely that we'll see mass deployment in the coming years. Now is our opportunity to influence the design, both the physical design and the chemical design of perovskites to make them more sustainable. This is the most recent global projection. So as I said earlier, we need to hit 14 terawatts by 2050. The important point is we need to immediately triple the rate of deployment of perovskites. We need to deploy technologies enormous, uh, very, very quickly. So where do some of those elements come from? I said there's one risk in that they have to compete for elements. Another risk is that every critical raw material, every technology metal has a supply risk associated it, to it. Unfortunately, those supply risks are calculated based on historical data. When we look at the effects of climate change and particularly water stress, most of the copper and lithium mines, for example, around the world are in areas that are very susceptible to drought. If those areas um, undergo drought, the mining stops, we don't make our technologies, we don't mitigate climate change, and we have a runaway scenario. Again, you might think, well, what are we doing in terms of recycling these critical raw materials that are so important? This is, of course, the periodic table of elements. All of the elements that are co coloured in uh, are critical. They're critical to our economy, and they're fairly rare. And we currently, for most of them, the ones coloured in red, we recycle less than 1% of. Okay, so we need to improve recovery of materials. Because as it shows on the right, we need them for the low energy technologies, wind generation, electronic vehicles, solar generation, etc. This slide summarizes very well our problem to this point. Um, so if you see the black line and follow the black line on this graph, through history what we've done is we've dug materials out of the earth. We've extracted materials out of the earth, that's called primary materials. With that, we've generated the green line, which is value. We've delivered our economy, uh, delivered significant improvements to human life on earth, um, and, and yes, built our economy based on the extraction of materials from the earth. So that wouldn't be problematic if it wasn't for the other line, which is the orange line, which is our emission of carbon to the atmosphere, which is associated with that extraction from the earth. So what we need to do going forward is decouple our economy from the primary extraction of materials. Essentially what we need to do is stop extracting materials from the earth in the quantities that we are and cycle uh, these critical materials through more and more products um, so that we don't release this carbon. And if you look at how we are doing in these terms, in, in our circularity terms, last year we, we extracted around 100 gigatons of materials from the earth. We've cycled about 8.6% of that. Okay, if we continue to use materials with such frivolity, just about got it out, um, we will simply exhaust all of our sources of materials. And we can't mitigate climate change if we don't stop <coughs> the extraction of materials because 60% of the global greenhouse gas emissions are tied with the primary extraction of materials from the earth. Okay, so what we need to do is develop a circular economy. So if you look at a circular economy, what we have is the line straight down the middle of, of the graph. We dig materials out of the earth. We make parts with those parts. We make products. We give them to a service provider. They then go to us, the consumer, the user. We use them. We might keep them for a while. We throw them away when they stop working. We, that might go to energy from waste historically, or it'll just go to landfill. It's very, very wasteful. So what we need to do is design products, our solar cells, our phone, our cars, everything that we use, so that one, the user can maintain it for a longer time, keep it in a productive life. When they can't reuse it, sorry, when they can't maintain it, we should then reuse it. A good example of this is when a battery in an electronic car um, becomes unsuitable for that application, we can still use it in domestic storage of energy. 
Okay, so we can take those batteries, directly reuse them. When we can't reuse things anymore, they should be designed in such a way that we remanufacture them. Okay, so by remanufacturing, I mean we take a solar cell, it stops working, we make another solar cell. What we do at the moment is we take a solar cell, it stops working, so we shred it up and we put it into roads. We're just wasting these critical materials that we need. So recycling becomes one of our last options, not, not the go-to option, okay? So there's, there's greater environmental and economic value in the tighter loops of the circular economy. Where we can, we need to incorporate biologically derived materials into devices that are inherently more sustainable. Um, and we've done quite a lot of work with the University of KwaZulu-Natal, the Nanotechnology Center, who are very good at green chemistry, in looking at bio-derived materials for integration into, into batteries and photovoltaics and things like that. Okay, another thing is that in our, in our effort to deploy technologies and mitigate climate change, we're gonna create lots and lots of waste. That's gonna turn the public away, or potentially turn the public away from photovoltaic technologies. And that's something that we have to be met very mindful from. When we go from fossil fuels that are finite, we transition to renewable energies, they're still based on finite materials. What we need to develop is truly sustainable renewable energy technologies. One thing we can do in the UK, we don't have great sources of critical raw materials or technology metals, but we do import lots of technology. That technology, that electronic waste, contains these materials that we need. What do we currently do with our electronic waste? We throw it in the bin. So what we need, and, and then as a country, we pay somebody to take it away. What we need to do is to stop exporting this electronic waste find better ways to extract these critical materials and turn that into high value products. Um, IRENA estimated by, by 2050, there'll be around 60 million tons of solar waste. At the moment, we haven't got a way to deal with that very well. If we could turn that into new panels, we could turn that into about 2 billion new photovoltaic panels worth around $15 billion to the economy. That's gonna create jobs and societal impact. And these are the things we need to do. Also, I'll just say, we've done calculations on the 60 million tons of waste. And because the deployment of photovoltaics is faster than expected, we think this is likely to be upwards of 100 million tons by mid-century. Okay, and this is where we need different technologies. So it's not a case of do we need perovskites or silicon solar cells? Do we need lithium or sodium batteries? We're gonna need all technologies to play their part in our transition. Um, and for the first time, perovskites have started to be identified as potentially taking market share away from silicon. So um, this is an IEA forecast. And what you'll know that in um, a case where we commercialize perovskites, we can limit the silicon demand um, to a decent amount. Silicon is also becoming increasingly critical and we need it for those photovoltaic panels. So we need all technologies to play their part in mitigating climate change. One thing that's really nice about uh, perovskites, I mentioned that they're solution processed so we can print them. That means that we can use solvents and chemistry to dissolve those layers at end of life, recover those materials, and put them back down into a solar cell. And my research group um, is actively looking at ways to do this and to do it at larger scales. But to do that, we need to change the solvents we use. So the solvents traditionally used to make perovskite solar cells um, are things like DMF, which is highly toxic. So what we've done is look to replace DMF. It's not particularly easy to replace. It's a polar diprotic solvent um, and has perfect characteristics for the dissolution of perovskite materials. So what we did is we split up the jobs we want that solvent to do and use four component systems. So we use things like the MPU, um, dimethyl suboxide, um, ethanol, and two methyl tetrahydrofuran to get a nice mix of solvents that are not green but they are significantly better than DMF. And we've got a nice handle now on how that affects the morphology of our perovskites, 
the performance of the perovskites so we can achieve the same performance with greener solvents than we do with hazardous solvents. And this is going to be more important as we look to recycle and remanufacture devices. Furthermore, we've come up with a selection framework to guide others in the field in how to make these decisions around sustainable solvents. Okay, I'm going to wrap up quite quickly in the next sort of five minutes. So I just wanted to talk um, about then international development opportunities. So I'm talking about mitigating climate change um, and deploying technologies. What about developing countries where we want to deploy green energy technologies? There's significant problems with waste and end of life. So if we look at sub-Saharan Africa, uh, it, it has a particular set of circumstance um, which makes it a very interesting problem, okay? So the population of Africa is obviously growing significantly. By 2035, there'll be more people of working age in Africa than the rest of the world combined. The majority of the population is now moving to urban centers to try to find work. That causes problems in those centers and uh, damages human health and things like that. Um, so we need to find a way of electrifying, electrifying sorry, rural Africa. There's a big opportunity here for printable, low-cost, large area um, photovoltaics. Okay, so if we think about things like batteries, I often talk about Nigeria as a case study. Nigeria is a target of 30 gigawatts of installed solar capacity by 2030. That needs an initial installation of 40 million batteries over the lifetime. That's going to use something like 200 million batteries, predominantly lead-acid batteries. Um, this is how they're treated at end of life. So lead-acid batteries are, are typically smashed open. The, lead, uh, the acid leaches to the earth. The valuable lead is removed um, and, and then sold. Okay? So this causes enormous problems for people's health and the environment. And we need to come up with much better solutions than this. Through my work in Swansea University, I've been lucky enough to, to take undergraduates um, to places like Zambia. And this is one of our undergraduate trips to Zambia where we installed photovoltaic panels in an orphanage in northern Zambia. And through this, we can learn how these technologies do over time. So what we found when we went back a year later is the batteries that we were promised would last four to six years were already dead, okay? So they didn't work. So that 200 million batteries for Nigeria is likely to be more like 950 million batteries in waste. We're talking about considerable amounts of electronic waste. So we need to look at ways to remanufacture, to close the circle as they call it, um, to look after these technologies better end of life. It also gave me a great appreciation for problems. So I knew before I went to Zambia that dust is an issue for photovoltaics um, uh, in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, or at least parts of. I didn't appreciate how much of a problem it was, um, and it, it really was significant. When we returned a year later, the photovoltaic panels were not producing anything, of course. Um, I've cleared the right-hand side, and I'm working my way across, but the left-hand side isn't producing any electricity, as you can imagine. We've also been fortunate in going to Siavonga, in southern Zambia, and we've done things like installed a solar-powered aquaponic system. So that's taking the waste from fish to feed plants to grow food um, in a quicker manner and to grow fish for food. So a more sustainable use of water, energy, and food. Um, with this, in the University of KwaZulu-Natal, we've set up a solar energy testing facility. So this allows us to do things like we've done in the middle here, bury batteries a meter in the earth and hope that the thermal lag, so the lower temperature, prolongs the lifetime of those batteries. Again, it often throws up other problems that we didn't expect. So the two batteries in the top right-hand corner are now dead. That's because there was a flood um, and they become completely damaged. Some of the solar panels were stolen. Um, so we're learning lots about how to deploy <coughs> technologies uh, in different environments. So just to finish, I just wanted to say, particularly for the students, some things that I found very useful during my career 
um, predominantly because they were fun things to do, but they also were useful for my career. One is working with professional bodies, so I work with the Royal Society of Chemistry quite a lot, um, and, and we've raised issues around critical raw material use towards decarbonisation and technologies, etc., and to inform legislation. On top of that, I've been fortunate enough to do lots of outreach events, uh, outreach in the UK, outreach in Europe, outreach in Africa, and to really um, try, to, to try to inspire others to take up science uh, and have fun along the way. So one thing that was ingrained in me as a PhD student is to have fun along the way, and you can see me there in the chemistry labs in Sil uh, Singleton, sorry. Um, I, I certainly had a lot of fun during my PhD. Um, I, I ate a lot more food and drank a lot more wine than I do now, um, which you might be able to tell. Um, I also need to recognize the privilege that I've had to help me get to this point in my career, and a lot of that comes from the people I get to work with, and this is my research group, and everybody that's been a part of my research group over the years, so I'm extremely grateful to them. Um, as you can see, particularly by the top left picture, science is hard sometimes. This is my former um, postdoctoral research associate, Catherine, and uh, former master's student, Gabriel, measuring solar cells overlooking beaches in Rio de Janeiro, uh, Rio de Janeiro um, in Brazil. So, I mean, somebody's got to do it, right? Um, uh, so thank you to all of my research group. Um, I would also like to thank Peter Douglas, who is in the audience, my PhD supervisor, who really got me going on my journey um, and, and taught me um, a great deal about academic life and being a scientist. I was then fortunate in Queenborough to be taught uh, and to work with two wonderful people in Professor Hugh Burrows and Professor Maria Grassa Miguel. Uh, I then moved to Bangor and worked as part of a, a, a great research group there with Professor Peter Holloman, who is now also in Swansea University. And when I came to Swansea University, of course, I got to work with wonderful people here. Um, and I'm very much grateful for uh, the help of Tristan Watson, Cecile Charbonneau, Mark Carney, and Dave Worsley over the years, and everybody really that's been involved in specific. But throughout all of this, Everybody I've worked with has made um, scientific research fun. And I think sometimes the job is very hard and stressful and we all get frustrated with things, but it's a real privilege to do the job that I do. With that, I would also like to thank my family for their support and uh, encouragement over the years. So my wife, my parents, my grandparents, uh, my parents-in-law, my sister. Um, I, I've been given a lot of privilege in just being allowed to get on with things, I think, in terms of my academic career um, and, and throughout schooling. So thank you to all of those. Um, I'm not going to go through everybody, of course, but I, I, I am grateful to all of my research group, all of my collaborators, everybody involved in specific. Um, I'm sorry if I've missed everybody out. Uh, I'd like to thank all of my international collaborators, all of the funders, um, all of the um, projects I've worked on, my colleagues in University of KwaZulu-Natal that are also um, incredible colleagues to work with. Um, people that I didn't mention but I would like to thank at this point is all of the staff in chemical engineering and material science and engineering um, it, for all of your support over the years. And thank you for listening. That's me done.